able to do at this point. So let's talk about parabolas and coming up with a great equation for parabolas uh, by the use of matrices. Uh, it doesn't have to be by matrices. There's other ways to write parabolas, but uh, we're studying matrices right now, so it'd be a good idea to try to fit that together. Any three non-collinear points with distinct x-coordinates determine exactly one second-degree second polynomial, which is a quadratic or a parabola. So the graph of that second-degree polynomial is a parabola. And they're given us three points. It says determine A, B, and C so that the points negative 1, 5, 2, negative 1, and 3, 13 are on. It doesn't say are close to. We're not talking about doing regression here. We're saying we want to find. A, B, and C, so that it will go through those three points. And we can absolutely do that, and we can absolutely do that accurately. But the first thing we have to do is think about what information we have and what we need to know. Negative 1 and 5. So what that means is, if I put a negative 1 into this equation, I'm supposed to get a 5 back. Okay. So the negative 1 would go in for what? X. Well, there's X's here. Let's try to stick a negative 1 in there and see what happens. So we'd have A times negative 1 squared plus B times negative 1 plus C, and that has to come out to 5 somehow. Well, we can simplify that a little bit. That will give us 1A minus B plus C equals 5. Okay, that looks a lot like we were doing yesterday with X, Y, and Z. So if we can just get three of those, we can pop it into the calculator either, and they're going to have us use inverses, or we can also probably do the usual echelon form and get the answer. We just have to do that with the other two points as well. So the next one we have up there, if you put a 2 in, you're negative 1. And you have to remember, you put a 2 in for what? X, exactly. So A times 2 squared plus B times 2 plus C has to come out to be a negative 1. Can you simplify it a little bit? Kind of something that would really nice to do. The black one up there, the blue one up there, the black one up there, this so we're going to slide this down later. And one more point, 3 and 13. Oops, change colors. All right, so this one will be 9a plus 3b plus c equals 13. So now we have our system of equations, and it does help to write them all down in one spot. We have a minus b plus c equals 5. Or a plus 2b plus c equals negative 1. And 9a plus 3b plus c equals 13. And to show your work, you really should go ahead and write these as a matrix. I know it's probably easy for you guys just to go ahead and punch it right into the calculator, but because we want to show our steps, we'd stop and say, I'm going to write the coefficient matrix. 1, negative 1, 1. I'm going to put that 1 in there. 4, 2, 1. 9, 3, 1. Times sum. A, B, and C. And that's supposed to give me results over here, 5, negative 1, and 13. And the reason I'm calling it the results is because this is kind of called the resultant vector. You know, that's, that's what we want to get out of all of these, so the resultant matrix. But we also know if we're going to work with AX equals B, and we're going to solve it, we have to use the matrix A as an inverse, but it has to stay on the left because order is really important with matrices. So if we can just get those in, we can pop it in there and see what happens. I didn't cheat here, by the 
way I already put these matrices in. So you can go ahead and do yours. Does anybody need to borrow a calculator today? Because that took so long yesterday getting everything in there. So we edit and get everything in. And that will be the coefficient matrix. And we quit out of there and go back in. put another matrix in and that little bugger is just the little three by one that had our results in there the result matrix five negative one thirteen and then we go back to the execution window and we tell it we want matrix a but we want the inverse of that matrix times in this case I used B I give everybody time to get it all there's our A, B, and C. Right there. A would need to be 4, B would need to be negative 6, and C would need to be 3, 5. Now our answer is going to be dependent on how they said to find these. It just said determine A, B, and C so that the points are on the graph of. So we could just label this A, B, and C. But pretty obviously if we're supposed to do some more math with this quadratic, we're going to write it as 4x squared minus 6x minus 5. So it just depends on the did have one really nice row. I want you to go back and think about that. In this matrix, which row would we really want to make so start off? Yeah, that first one right up top, that's the one right in that leftmost position. So it wouldn't have taken forever, but um, much quicker with the calculator. So that is parabolas, writing quadratics with using matrices, which goes pretty down kind of fast. Now, some of your favorite problems, I'll bet. Mixture problems, if you've ever taken chemistry, those are just such lovely problems here. Um, Eileen's drugstore needs to prepare a 60 liter mixture that is 40% acid using three different concentrations of acid. So they look on the shelf, what they need is not there. This happened a lot in pharmacy when you're working with the NICU, the neonatal intensive care unit. Little teeny babies need very little amounts of medication. So you have to take the adult stuff and you have to pare it down. So the first concentration they see on the, the shelf is 15% acid. The second is 35% acid, and the third is 55% acid. Because of the amounts of acid solution on hand, they're going to have to use twice as much of the 35% loose solution as the 55. So they were thinking about it and said, well, we could just use the 15 and the 55, but then they looked at the jug with the 55% on it, and it didn't have enough in there. So if they have to use the 35%, twice as much. So how much of each solution should they use? Well, this kind of leads us through it, which is nice. Let x equal the number of liters of 15% solution that's used, y the number of 35% solution, and then z as the 55% solution. Explain how x plus y plus z is related to the problem if it equals 60. And we go back up here and we see it's the amount so this must be the amount of each of the concentrations that need to add up to that 60. It just makes sense since that's our label. So the amount of each concentration. 
necessary to get 60 liters of the mixture. All it has to do with what are the pieces here. So we can put all of those together. Now the next one is a little tougher. It says explain how the equation point 15x plus 0.335y plus 0.55z equals 20 volts. Now the left side, that's not hard at all. We go up there and we see that's the concentrations. That's what all of that is. Concentration and how much. Concentration and how much. Concentration and how much. So this must be concentration and how much. There's no 24 up there anywhere. Well, that's because we have to do that math ourselves. We have to say the concentration is supposed to be 40% times how much we want. Big shocker, that comes out to 24. So how is this related? It's concentration times The amount used. All the way through. So sometimes the total is really easy to get, you know, a label for it and figure out how things are working. Sometimes it's actually the more involved side of the equation that helps you figure out hey, where do all these numbers come from. Now, why on earth would you have to have the little equation y equals 2z? What up there would tell us that? It. Why do we have a y equals 2z as one of the equations? You have to use twice as much of the 35% as the 55%. So that's where that one came from. That was just a one sentence that gives us a so now it says write the system of three equations that would be obtained from steps one through three. Because we had three equations there, and we're going to solve this using inverse matrices again. So the first one up here was one, one, one. Again, really nice that that's a first row. The next one, 0 0.15, 0 0.35, 0 0.55. Last one, y equals 2z. Hmm. Well, all of this stuff is x, y, and z. So I better get everything on one side and see what I have. That'll be y minus 2z equals 0. So I don't get any x's, uh, but I do get 1y and negative 2z. This matrix would just be our little x, y, and z. And then we have our resultant matrix. So we got the five. Let's see, the first one was 60. The next one was the 24. So what do we put in there for our little y minus 2z equals 0? 0. What was in there? So solve the matrix. Well, let's do inverse matrices just like we did. So go ahead and you can override the ones you had in there if you want to, or make new matrices. Like I said, I cheated this morning and just at least got these two in before we had a meeting. So these won't take quite as long. Like I said, if, if you just overrode yours, you're probably just using A and B to bring them up. Since I cheated this morning and stored them in there, I've got them in C and D. That's the 
that's how much you're going to need. Right there. 3.75 of the weakest, 37.5 of the, I think it was 35%, and then 18.75 of the 55%. And that is what we are supposed to do for 5 and 6. We are supposed to solve it, which we just did. And then C, C1, 6, we only have A, B, and C, D. Um, we're a trick rule, so we have to put it into words. What on earth did we find? Well, they should use. is always very basic and easy to do, but it's the interpreting that gets your scores higher than your stats. So you see what they're actually using this for. All right, so that was finishing up yesterday's objective. How do you feel about our two word problems? What do you feel about your problem? That's like horrible once you get into the matrix, right? Yeah. And so it's it's the word problem thing. I know that's, that's bugging some of you, but um, if you make your way to the matrices, you'll be just fine. And I had this one up yesterday, so I'm not sure whether or not I can stick a picture of it in that. Sure, what the last few days have been like that because it took me so Everybody has it written down and working on it. So now you can finish up the parabola and the mixture problems. But we are going to move on today to a very cool topic. Um, not that we ever cover anything that's not very cool, but. All right, now I know there's one word you're not liking when you saw this right away. Fractions. We are and we aren't working with fractions. What we're going to do is we're going to find a way to use matrices so that we don't really work with fractions all the way through. We work with integer numbers. Whenever we can. Sometimes we can't avoid it. Things just end up being fraction. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start learning how to decompose fractions. It's as basic as this. If you want to add two fractions together, you have to add a common denominator. You just do. So what we have to do is multiply this one by 7 on the top and the bottom, and multiply this one by 2 on the top and the bottom. But that's composing. So what we're going to do today is we're going to be given this, and it's our job to work backwards and find these two that we have with it. Now, there's no x's in anything I have here. 
that makes this, if you look at it and you go, wouldn't there be a lot of ways you could do that? Yes, but when there are variables involved, no, there are not a lot of ways that you can do this. So we're going to be using algebra to go from the result back to what were the original fractions that were involved. So that's a really important piece. We've talked about this before in calculus. If you have something that you can't integrate or you can't differentiate, you have to know, I've got to try some other things. Maybe I can do this and come from the pieces that I have. I can actually do those things for. So we're going to decompose a fraction with distinct linear factors. And I don't know if we'll get to anything other than that today, but um, we're also going to decompose fractions with repeated linear factors. Fractions with irreducible quadratic factors. That means things like this. X squared plus 1. You can't factor that. There is no way to factor x squared plus 1 and get nice integers. So that's called an irreducible quadratic factor. This is not. Because this we can factor. This is a difference of two squares. That's x plus 1 and x minus 1. So... This is what we mean by an irreducible quadratic factor. We're going to decompose a fraction with a repeated irreducible quadratic factor, probably tomorrow, and apply our knowledge of decomposition of partial fractions to fractions, hyperbolas. So lots of cool uses for this. Partial fractions. We're going to start, like I said, with partial fraction <coughs> decomposition, and a polynomial with re real coefficients might be factored into a product of factors real coefficients, where each factor is either linear or an irreducible quadratic factor. Now, one of the things that I had to add since last year was how do we factor the difference of two cubes. And that's because generally at this point in the year, it's been so long since we did any factoring that we forget what the formula is for this. But maybe, just maybe, there's somebody out there that remembers the formula for factoring. Remember, it has subtraction here, so subtraction takes precedence. You start with the subtraction, but then the rest of it will need the addition so that you don't get any middle terms. So with this one, we look at it and say, well, what am I cubed to get x cubed? x. Yeah, just 1x. That's all it is. And then what are we cubed to get 64? 4. And then all we do is substitute those into the formula. So for A, we're going to put an X, and for B, we're going to put a 4. Now, the first factor, X minus 4, that's a linear factor because this is X to the first. The second one, that's a quadratic factor. And if we look at it for a little bit, we're going to figure out it's irreducible. You know, we can't factor X squared plus 4, X plus 16. There are not two numbers that exist that multiply to 16 and add to 4. That happens a lot with the difference of two cubes and some of the factors. So, in this section, what we are going to do is um, show that a rational function can be expressed as the sum of rational functions. Let's scoop that up for you. Where each denominator is the power of a linear factor or a power of an irreducible quadratic factor. Because this is a big deal, a very big deal for what you're going to do in calculus, although that might play over and over again, so I'm going to kind of make sure it stops. Pretty rare that you can use a sound like that a couple of years in a row and it'll work. All right, so each fraction in our decomposition um, is a partial fraction. And the sum is called partial fraction decomposition. So we take the big fraction, we break it into parts. Each individual is a partial fraction. Together, when you add them, you've got a partial fraction decomposition. You know, we don't get
give up in math. I always say there's two rules in math. You don't give up and there's no crying. <laughs> you just keep trying. That's what you do. You just keep going. And so these things came out of necessity. People are working with math and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm stuck right here. There's nothing I can do. What do I try? Well, it's a fraction. Let's break it apart. Maybe the parts are usable instead of looking at the whole thing at one time. So on the next page, it says, let's start this way. Let's start with what we know. If you had these as fractions, think about putting them together. So what would you have to do so you could put those two fractions together? You need your common denominator. How are we going to get a common denominator? Some of you are already doing it. How did you determine your common denominator? The other one, because they both have to be there, right? I mean, that's that's usually how we think of it. So this one's going to need a little x plus 3 on the top and the bottom. And this one's going to need a little x minus 4 on the top and the bottom. But remember, we're really just multiplying by 1. So we haven't changed the value of this fraction by doing that. We're still just multiplying by 1. So across the top now, we would have 3x plus 9 over x plus 3 times x minus 4. And that would be added to 2x minus 8 over x plus 3 times x minus 4. And then when we see we have a common denominator, we're going to actually go and do the math. So 3x plus 2x is 5x plus 1 over x plus 3 times x minus 4. Now, what we're going to do is take this and bring it back to what's in the black. That's our job. If we have 5x plus 1 over this mess, where did it come from? What can we break it down into so that we can do it? So this section is going to give us techniques to perform this operation back. There are actually, we studied last year, three different techniques to do this. We stick with one because um, just knowing one of these, especially the one that we're going to teach you, will get you to do whatever it is you need to do. Really well. So we've got partial fraction decomposition of some f of x divided by b of x, any fraction that we have. Now, if the degree of the numerator is greater than the degree of the denominator, well, then you better just divide it. That's what we do. If we can divide it, we're simplifying it, and that's what we want to do. So we would do that division, and we'd get an answer, plus generally we're probably going to get a remainder in this section. So that's the first thing we would want to do. Now, other things we can do, we need to factor the denominator into the product of factors, hopefully linear factors, but we might give ourselves some irreducible quadratics. So here's the linear with the x to the first, and there's the quadratic. But the quadratics only stay like that if they're irreducible. If we can break them apart and continue to factor, we have to do that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, something over this factor plus something over this factor squared, if we do have that as one of our denominators, needs to continue on until we get every single power covered for that fraction. And then for number four, it says, if you happen to have an irreducible quadratic factor, that makes it a little bit different. Because what we have to do with irreducible quadratics is use a linear factor. These are just constants up here for our linear factors. But for irreducible quadratics, we're going to have to use a linear factor, which makes it a little bit more involved. Now, one of the things that this book does, um, and we don't like this, is sets it up with the same variable every time. You're not going to see us do that. That's because it just gets everything so complicated. If you forget your little ones and your little twos, you have no idea what you've done. So we'll cover that as we go through. And then it says the partial fraction decomposition of the original rational function is the sum of its parts. So breaking it apart. Partial fractions, here it comes. Very useful for integration and calculus. Huge. Better learn this in steps because it has multiple steps. So let's go. Writing, here's what we're doing. Writing the decomposition factors. 
we want to write the terms for the partial fraction decomposition of this rational function. We're not going to solve it. We're just going to start by saying, okay, these are the things that this could be. So, as I think about breaking down this fraction, I realize one of the denominators could have been just x. Because this is x cubed. So they might have had to build that up. Another one might have just been x squared. And they had to multiply that by x to get here. It is possible that one of the fractions just had an x cubed. Then they also had an x plus 3. But that doesn't have any powers, so I'm just going to need one of those in the denominator. Because remember, they had to build up one new fraction. And then the last one here that we have is this x squared plus 1. And that's from the start, because that is an irreducible quadratic. I can't factor that. So I have to think in my head, that's the one that's going to need something linear. The rest of these just need a constant. So this could be A, this could be B, C, and D. All different numbers to get there. But this last one is going to have to be EX plus F. Because those irreducible quadratics have to have linear factors on the top. So notice, X, X squared, X to the third, X plus 3, those are all fine. But this irreducible quadratic has to be linear. So that's how we break them down. That's where we start, is just by saying, okay, these are all the things the denominator could be that we could build this up into. So we would have one, two, three, four, five partial fractions that would give us our sum of partial fractions right there. That's the starting place for all of these. It's just breaking it down and what do you have? Now remember, you might want to write this in here. This was our only irreducible quadratic. That's why it had a different numerator. That was our only irreducible quadratic. The rest of them, we just put constant in here. And it's perfectly fine. So this is step one for every problem. Every problem, you find all the factors of your denominator and you get it set up. Now we're going to keep going with it. It says examples 2 and 3 will show us how the constants, and the, like I said, the book uses a sub i, but the constants a, b, c, and, and d and e is uh, the one we just looked at uh, of the partial fraction decomposition procedure can be found. How we can actually get numbers to put up there. Because that's what we want to do. All right. Let's get started. The first thing I would want to try to do is factor this denominator. I don't want to have to have irreducible quadratics. I want this to be something nice. So my hope is that we can find two numbers that multiply to negative 15 and add to negative 2. We have a couple. What are they? Negative 5 and 3. Start there with those factors. Now we know we don't have any irreducible quadratics. Both of those are linear. They are x to the first. So one of our denominators has to be x minus 5. The other one has to be x plus 3. And the best news, it's just going to be some number over x minus 5 plus some number over x plus 3. So when we're done, we're going to find the numbers that go in for A and for B. Okay, so how do we make that happen? We think backwards. We think about the math we already know. So I write down the fraction, the partial fractions that I have here. And I think, if I were to put these together, what would I have to do? The process we talked about earlier. Do that. We have to have those matching denominators. And if we did that, what on earth am I going to get? Well, this would give me ax plus 3a. And then in the back, 
I'd have plus bx minus 5b. I don't care about the denominators anymore because they're common denominators and I know they're going to work to get me what I need. I have to have this happen. Otherwise, I can't write these two fractions. So then I think, okay, don't I know what that has to work out to be? It has to be that. It has to be 5x minus 1. So, I know I have to get a 5x, and I know I have to get a minus 1. And I think about which of these would give me this. Well, these are the ones with the x's. So ax plus bx has to come out to 5x. Well, the other two are just constants. So 3a minus 5b has to come out to negative 1. And as we've talked about in the past, you could just take the x's right out of this, and you could use a matrix to solve this if you wanted to. Or you could set it up as an x and a y, and solve it algebraically. Up here, if I have 1a and 1b, I can think of that as 1x and 1y equals 5. And down here on the bottom, this will be 3x minus 5y equals negative 1. You can solve it systems like this since you're an exponential. I would just do some substitution. So x equals negative y plus 5. Plug it in for x. And find y. is 3 and y is 2. If you want to use a and b, you could do that. You could just drop the x's from this and say a plus b equals 5 and 3a minus 5b equals negative 1 and I get a and b. But now all I have to do is remember that my x was what I needed for a. So that means this should be a 3. And my b value, I scrolled up before I took a look at it, what was my b value? 2. Be a 2. So all I do is substitute those in and say, here's my answer. 3 over x minus 5 plus 2 over x plus 3. There they are. So when we can find linear factors, this is a nice process. I mean, it really is. And you have all kinds of choices for how you're going to solve this when you get to this point. And what they're, they're making sure that we understand is this is checkable because here's what we said. What we just did was to say this is exactly the same thing as this. That means if we graph this function and we graph this function, we should only see one graph. You should never see a difference between the two. And that's what's going to happen if we put them in. Now, they went ahead and used inverses. Like I said, you could use reduced row echelon form. You could do whatever you wanted. But both of those graphs look exactly like this. There is no change. And that's what we want to make sure happens. What you start with and what you end with are exactly the same. So it doesn't hurt to stop after you've done all that work of checking and make sure that they do graph the same. All right, thank you. Oh. Well, we can at least set this one up. You know, we might not be able to finish it off, but we can at least set this one up. So, how did we start the last one? Yeah, we got to factor that denominator because I don't know about you, but that x cubed thing is kind of scary. We didn't have any rules for cubes. So, 
So what do you see in that denominator? Yeah, let's pull an X out. Let's get that common monomial factor of X out of there. Now again, if I don't have to have irreducible quadratics, I don't want them. So I'm trying to figure out, is there a way to factor X squared minus 4X plus 4? Is there? What is it? X minus 2 to the quantity squared. Good. All right. So now I need to set it up. And I know one of my denominators is X. It could have been that one of them was just X minus 2. And that's because we always build up our denominators to make them the same. But it also could have been that we had an X minus 2 squared. That's good news because that means you can just slap an A, B, and C up here. Build them up and figure out what they need to be. So, if I had started at this point, that's probably the best we can do. I can wait for you to change this up before we go. I'll use this for quite a bit for tomorrow, but we don't do the tornado drill this hour. So maybe we'll be okay. Um, you're not going to be able to do everything on this one. You'll be able to finish up 7-3. But if you want to write that one down and just start giving it a try. Some of these at the beginning are just the uh, set it up. Don't solve it. Just set it up as partial fractions. Probably do a, a couple of the partial decompositions that we just did. 